Hey everyone, welcome back to the NPTE podcast. This is Will Crane, your host. Thank you so much for joining me as we go through the content you need in order to dominate the NPTE. So uh, today we've got a question for you related to the non-systems equipment and devices. But before I get to that, just a quick thank you. Thank you for what you do. I know that as you are studying, as you're going through all the efforts to memorize content, get it to stick, applying it, not just on, on test questions, but also in your practice, in your clinical practice, as you're doing your final clinicals, whether you're on your, your final rotation, second to last rotation, or even your first rotation. Just so you know, thank you. Thank you for what you do. I know that it's a big effort and that it's, it's a big blessing, not just to you, but to your patients, to their lives, their families. I know that it, it makes a big difference there. So today I've got a practice question related to the non-systems. So if you recall on the non-systems, the non-systems on the NPT, this is a somewhat a a smorgasbord of of these smaller subsections. And I get asked all the time, Will, what's the best resource for the non-systems? So speaking of the non-systems broadly, there are five main categories, equipment, devices, technology, therapeutic modalities, safety and protection, professional responsibilities, and then finally, research and evidence-based practice. Now, each of these five subcategories really has an entire book dedicated to it. For instance, the therapeutic modalities. If you consider that, the therapeutic modalities, are, there will be somewhere between four and six questions related to that. Really, that's the, the scope of an entire class at, in, in PT school would be related entirely to the therapeutic modalities. Now, that being said, they're going to focus on the most common ones. They'll focus on the ones that are, are easily and most commonly done in entry-level practice. We're talking like the electric, electro modalities. We're talking about the thermal modalities, the cryo modalities, all of that, that type of, of therapeutic modality. Uh, today, the question I've got for you is, is related to equipment, devices, and technologies. Now, what's interesting about all of the non-systems is that sometimes the questions they have will actually be couched in some of the other systems. So like musculoskeletal, like the question I've got for you today really is somewhat related to the musculoskeletal system, but it also crosses over into equipment, devices, and technology. So you'll see that theme carry over time and time again as you go through practice questions about this. And so today we'll talk through a practice question related to equipment, devices, and technologies. But before we do, just a quick reminder, If you're looking for a full robust class on the NPT, look no further than our VIPT program. So our VIP program is where we go through all of the content on the FSBPT's content outline to get you ready for test day. Really gives you the tools to succeed on test day. We go through twice a week study sessions, going through practice questions. You get the ability to to contact and be, have one-on-one phone calls with me. Plus, uh, we have a whole very robust library of video content. You get complimentary access to all of our crash course material, all of our practice exams. Really, you get access to the entire entire spectrum of what we've got for you at PT Final Exam. So be sure to check that out, the VIP program. And we're starting that actually next week. So as I'm recording this the first week of February, we typically start that about, uh, about, well, it is a 10-week class. We start that 10 weeks before every test day. But you are welcome to join anytime. So if you're listening to this down the road and you say, hey, should I jump into the VIP program? You get nine months of access from your date of enrollment. So you're welcome to jump in anytime. Essentially, you'll get three full sessions of the class or three full courses of the class as we go through. So uh, ideally, the sooner the better gets you the most bang for your buck on the VIP program. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into our practice question here for today. Uh, As per usual, I will read to you the question, give you a moment to respond, and then we'll talk about it together. Here we go. An eight-year-old child with spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA, spinal muscular atrophy type 2, is being assessed for mobility needs while at public school. Which of the following devices will be most appropriate to assist with functional mobility? All right, we have an eight-year-old child with spinal muscular atrophy type 2 being assessed for mobility needs while at public school. Which of the following devices will be most appropriate to assist with functional mobility? Number one, parapodium. Number two, pediatric transport stroller. Number three, posterior walker. And number four, ultralight manual wheelchair. So the four options are parapodium, two, pediatric transport stroller, three, posterior walker, and four, ultralight manual wheelchair. 
So spinal muscular atrophy, this is an autosomal recessive disorder, and actually it's the second most common after cystic fibrosis. And the key characteristic of spinal muscular atrophy is the degeneration of the anterior horn cells, which leads to skeletal muscle weakness. And it's often, I mean, the name of it is spinal muscular atrophy. You get rapid weakness of the, uh, of the core or trunk muscles holding up the spine. And so it, very often these folks require some type of TLSO, some type of orthotic that holds their thorax and trunk in an upright posture. That being said, weakness is the key issue and it is progressive. So you would expect that the hypotonia is going to progress from a moderate severity to a, a very severe severity, a severe severity, from moderate, moderate to severe eventually. In this case, the question is asking about, all right, you've got an eight-year-old child in public school, which of the following devices will be best to assist with functional mobility? So anytime you're talking assistive devices, you need to consider, all right, what are the needs of the patient and what would maximize their function? And so in this case, a child with spinal muscular atrophy is most likely to benefit from an ultralight manual wheelchair. This will give them the ability in a public school setting. So typically we're talking about, we're not negotiating uneven surfaces really a lot. I mean, there could be some exceptional cases there, but typically we're talking uh, limited distances over flat, even surfaces. Uh, I, I would argue that that the, pretty much every school is is like that. So you you are within the building. There would be elevators and ramps to get in. Uh, honestly, there would be a lot of of assistance in. I guess not assistance, but uh, we'll we'll call it accessibility options for the patient. In this case, an eight year old child. How do we best maximize their ability to negotiate the environment? And in this case, the best one is going to be the ultralight manual wheelchair. Now, this certainly would provide if a caregiver was to assist. They would be able to to assist with with some type of uh, you know as the the child needs to negotiate uh, maybe a ramp or maybe they're very tired at the end of the day so certainly there could be some instances where they require caregiver support but an ultralight manual wheelchair would back maximize the patient's function so that they could negotiate inside the classroom they'd be able to maneuver and and really really access the entire school environment fairly easily now, these other answer options, so option one, a parapodium, this is essentially a vertical standing frame. So it is helpful for standing, but it is not helpful for the functional mobility within a school environment. Essentially, the parapodium or standing frame would be a good treatment option. So if you wanted to reduce the joint contractures in the lower extremity, you may place them into a parapodium. However, if they're trying to move around inside the classroom, the parapodium is simply not going to be an option. Uh, the second one, this is uh, on the list of things that could be helpful would be a pediatric transport stroller. Again, this would be for a child who is entirely dependent. Now, implicit in spinal muscular atrophy type two is that it is a moderate weakness rather than a, a per, I mean, it does progress, but uh, usually these folks, it, the weakness really hits by the time they hit pubescence. So once they, they start to develop into their adult bodies, they get the the more severe contractures and hypotonia really starts to set in. So eight-year-old child, they a, a type one spinal muscular atrophy, this is the most severe. This is where usually it's onset as an infant and mortality is extreme within the first few years of life. And so then spinal muscular atrophy type two, these folks typically, they, they survive beyond 10 years of age, but they get the more severe symptoms that start to show up during puberty. And then finally, spinal muscular atrophy type three, this would be classified as the least severe. However, it is a progressive uh, progressive weakness that usually these folks are ambulatory at some point, but then eventually transition from ambulation down into a some type of a wheeled mobility device. And so in this case, a spinal muscular atrophy type two, kind of the mid-level, you'd say, it, it, it is certainly important and certainly affects the patient's life. Uh, but that being said, they are most likely to be able to be able to control an ultralight manual wheelchair. So a pediatric transport stroller, that would be more appropriate for say a type one, or if there was something in the question that indicated that the, the child uh, lacked any, co if there was cognitive deficits or, or any type of issue where uh, the child would be unable to, to steer or negotiate the chair from a cognitive standpoint. And then finally, the last incorrect answer option is the posterior walker. So posterior walkers, these are great for, for children, especially with neuromuscular disorders like cerebral palsy. 
They're ideal for helping to maintain an upright posture. So children with spinal muscular atrophy, uh, ambulation really is not a huge, well, I, I guess I should say it depends on which type, but for a, a type two, ambulation is really not a, an option because of the severe, the severe loss of muscle tone in the spinal muscles. So a posterior walker would, would more likely be used in like a, a type three. So if you had spinal muscular atrophy type three, or perhaps uh, if the child had cerebral palsy, a posterior walker would be very helpful to help maintain upright posture during ambulation. Again, back to this choice or, or to the correct answer option, which is the ultralight manual wheelchair, which would maximize function and and permit the child to maneuver within the environment in a way that, that gives them the most support with the most mobility, kind of that, that ever frequent balance between mobility and stability that is required. Really as PTs, we, we make that decision a lot to try to decide, okay, how do we mac maximize function? Uh, we want them to do as much as they possibly can. And you'll find that that is a discussion you have with your patients very, 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 very frequently. So there you go. Another pediatric case about spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, so uh, just of note, as far as the primary resource for this question and for all the questions I have, I, I have a textbook primary resource. This one comes from Goodman's Pathology. There's a lot of information about pediatric illnesses, and I'll try to include a lot of that in these podcast episodes just so that you've got a, at least a cursory knowledge of some of these pediatric illnesses, these neurodevelopmental disorders that can affect especially children. And so you as a PT, you'll likely encounter these at some point, whether it be in your first year of practice or if you're just in a general practice, somehow you'll likely come into contact with these at some point in your career. All right, so with that, we'll bring it to a conclusion today. Uh, if you haven't yet, be sure to head over to ptfinalexam.com slash podcast. Over there, that's where you'll find all of our freebies. It's not too late to sign up for some of our free giveaways. Again, we've got that free course coming up the end of February. If you want to attend that in person, that'll be in Chicago. That's where your uh, you get access to all of our premium features, so all of our exams, get access to all of our online content. You just have to get there. You have to get yourself to Chicago on that weekend of February 29th through March 2nd. If you're able to do so, everything is, is covered at that point. Your meals are covered, your housing's covered, the course is covered, everything. Again, a big shout out to our corporate, uh, we'll say our corporate sponsors here with Athletico. They're really making this happen. I, I think you'll really enjoy this event. Plus, they're, they're bringing in another speaker to talk about uh, paying off student loans for as little as possible. So again, another premium feature I mean, if you if you add all the everything up between our course, the PT final exam course, you get access to, plus the the student loan repayment course you'll have access to, plus your housing, plus your food. I mean, it's it is a screaming deal. All that totally for free, well over a thousand dollars worth of material that you'll get access to, totally free of charge. You just have to get yourself to Chicago for that weekend. So easiest way to register is to go to ptfinalexam.com/podcast where you'll be able to take advantage of all that and enjoy all of our freebies that we have. If you're listening to this down the road, again, check out ptfinalexam.com slash podcast to see our current promos and what it is that we are, uh, what, other, what else, other things that we're up to at that moment. So, all right, we'll bring it to, con to a conclusion. Thank you so much. I hope you have a happy and fabulous study day. Take care of yourself. We'll crane fist pumps all around and I'll catch you all in the next episode. Thanks. 